So we're outside of the um, district court in Wright County. We've just left Judge Tenney's courtroom. Judge Tenney, um, pursuant to an order issued by Federal Judge Donovan Frank, um, resentenced Terry Olson today to essentially time served on a conviction uh, that was handed down in 2007 in which we were uh, convinced and we were litigating was a wrongful conviction that Terry Olson was never involved uh, in the death of Jeffrey Hamill. Uh, if it was in fact a homicide, it wasn't something that Terry Olson was involved in, but um, the prosecutor about a month ago uh, offered to uh, stipulate to the release of Terry Olson for time already served if we would agree to uh, drop the habeas corpus action that was pending in federal court. Today, we're extremely happy. We're gratified. Terry Olson is out of prison. He doesn't have to serve any more time for a crime that he did not commit, and he can get on with his life. And whether or not there's a formal piece of paper saying that he's innocent, he's an innocent man, and we've corrected an injustice. I can yeah. imagine being behind bars for 11 years for something I didn't do. That is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. What do you think? Uh, well, he's coming now. Looks like you're going to be on every channel tonight. People won't be able to escape when? you. I would, when? Yes, I, would, I guess so. Wait, did you just say when? My kids will be thrilled. <laughs> Are you used to this? No. You like how I am? Not at all. Not, is this a pretty high profile case for you? It is, um, but it's, you know... More personal. More personal, exactly. Uh, we look forward to talking to him. Yeah, I'm sure he'll have, over over the years, he'll have plenty to say. <laughs> Today, I don't know. You know, Mr. Olson struggled a long time with the question of whether he was going to give up the right to get a judicial declaration of innocence in exchange for getting out of prison today. And that was an agonizing decision for him. So, no DNA? No DNA. No eyewitnesses? No eyewitnesses. I'll come back to that. Okay. No footprints, no tire tracks. This The body was found on the side of the road out in rural Minnesota near Buffalo, Minnesota. All that we had was an individual who was dead of something called a, a basilar skull fracture, which means that his uh, the back of his head was crushed in some fashion from a very heavy blow which could have been, and this was the, the deputy sheriff's theory, could have been somebody was driving along hauling a farm implement with part of it extending over the side of the highway. This guy was hitchhiking or walking along the side of the highway at 2.30 in the morning in August, and all of a sudden this thing hits him in the back of the head, down he falls, no signs of a scuffle, no signs of a fight, no signs of a car that was there, nothing in the ditch, no trampled grass, nothing. Uh, for years, this case, um, the uh, death certificate was undetermined, wasn't even, wasn't even considered a homicide. When they reopened the investigation, they interviewed um, a man named Dale Todd, who was a very vulnerable, uh, very fragile man, and the police, uh, in my opinion, coerced a confession from him, and his confession, as it were, his statement to the police was in conflict with known physical evidence. The case went forward because the police extracted this confession. It was recanted um, during the middle of a trial of the other person. So this Dale Todd says, me and Terry Olson and Ron Michaels did it. By the way, he went on to say, but Terry Olson sat in the car and, and wasn't actually involved, but he was there. That case goes to trial against Ron Michaels and in the middle of the examination by the prosecutor, he says, I can't do this, it's a lie, we weren't there, we had nothing to do with it. Ron Michaels is acquitted. Seven months later, oh, and Dale Todd, his reward for that recantation was, uh, they pulled the plea deal, he went to uh, prison on a three and a half year sentence. In the middle of that, seven months after the Ron Michaels acquittal, they pull him out, they meet with him before he's supposed to testify, and he testifies at trial against Terry Olson on pilot. You know, yes, no, yes, we did it, yes. 
Jerry Olson was convicted. Um, and then within days, literally, of that conviction, T Dale Todd sent a letter to the judge who uh, presided over the trial and said, we weren't there, I lied. I lied because I didn't want to get in trouble for something we didn't do. And that's the end of the story. And literally, years later, Terry Olson is still in prison. There was no hearing on that Dale Todd letter. There was other evidence we uncovered that is, uh, shows uh, his innocence, in our opinion. Um, Dr. Amatuzio, who was the medical examiner, was persuaded to change the death certificate of uh, Jeffrey Hamill from undetermined to homicide because the police who had gotten the confession from Dale Todd told her they had an eyewitness to the crime. Well, if you have an eyewitness, then I know it's a homicide, right? But Dr. Amatuzio was never told that that eyewitness had severe uh, mental health issues, um, had recanted the confession, that the confession was inconsistent with actual physical evidence. So it's, it's any number of things that have to go wrong for these kinds of wrongful convictions to occur. And today, we're, frankly, we're just ecstatic that we could finally bring this ordeal to an end for Terry. We don't have the slip of paper that says, Terry, you're innocent, but he knows he's innocent, and now he's out of prison, and whatever time he has left, whatever time with his family, with his mother, of his own, he gets today. There, there is, there is plenty of ability on all members of the system to do better and to not lose their way. I'm getting the call, Terry's being released. Hello. Welcome, Terry. What do you have to say? And you said the first stop was to go see your mom. She's in Osseo, is that right? Correct. And, yep. and how old is she? I believe she's 78 years old now. Okay. I have seen her one time in the last 11 years, so I'm looking forward to this. She doesn't know oh. that I'm coming, so uh, hopefully she's not watching TV and this isn't <laughs> live. <laughs> not live. Good. Okay. 
policy and all we did was get to the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. We were already they in did trouble, not want so us we there. would not have made it as long as, as anybody else there. Can we just do a do a quick thing? What's uh, the last eleven years? What uh, how have you been spending your time? Did you go to the law library? Did you say? I spent a lot of time in the law library. I spent a lot of time reading about the law. Um, I spent a lot of time writing supplements to my own briefs. Um, things and that letters. I letters. Yeah, and a bunch of letters. <laughs> I, I there isn't a congressman in the state I didn't write. I uh, wrote the governor. I, I, I wrote probably 50, 60 law firms. Mm. Um, I have a list of everybody I wrote, and I have a list of the responses I got. And the list of responses was much shorter than the list that I mailed out. Why won't anybody listen to me? Why, you know? Um, what did I do? Yeah, I've done nothing wrong. And, and, uh, no, prosecution came at me with more than one deal before all this happened. I could have walked 11 years ago. And, you know, I had a judge ask me uh, during my pretrial back in March of 2007 when they they offered me a deal of assault with time served. And the judge actually asked me if I knew what I was doing. You know, I said, Mr. Olson, you're, you're looking at walking out the door tomorrow, basically, or life in prison. And my answer was, what kind of person does that, Your Honor? Evidently, he didn't understand what I meant. <laughs> Things happen in life and people make mistakes, but they need to own them, you know? The mistakes I made in life, I own. I wish that things would have turned out differently. Having faith in, in a judicial system is is a is a tough road to hold. It, it's you know, one minute you think you're getting relief, and the next they're they're throwing something else at you that is in a totally different realm. And now you got to get back into the books again and figure out what's going on here. Turns into years. It turns into years. It, the, there's never months. And, you know, uh, months are just delays to the next hearing, and the next hearing brings another decision that comes a year later, and, and it's all just a way too slow a process. And uh, it's a it's a system that is burdened with not enough people to help. You know, um, if it weren't for the Innocence Project and, and, and David Schultz from Maslin, I'd still be in prison today. I, that's a fact. We'll carry in here and we just go right out here. Okay. Oh my gosh! 
I gotta give my sisters. <laughs> oh my god!
you know, be respectful of Terry. He's been through a lot. What was the first thing you did, Terry? Uh, was, uh, well, we uh, stopped and had a pizza, and then uh, we went to visit my mother. How was that? It was, uh, it was probably the most joyous event in my life. When was the last time you saw your mother? Um, in the 11 years that I was incarcerated, I saw her one time uh, on my birthday about four years ago. I have policies about wheelchairs in the DOC, and uh, it doesn't make it easy for uh, uh, people in wheelchairs to visit. So uh, that is just not the kind of place I want a mom to come and visit her son in. Being in prison for any amount of time, uh, whether it be a year or 20 years, uh, I know there's innocent people still there and uh, people that have spent more time than I did. But any amount of time being locked up for a crime that you didn't commit is excruciatingly painful and lonely. You know, without family, uh, and uh, if the Innocence Project and uh, Julie Jonas and, and uh, David Schultz from Madison LLP once that came on board, I don't know whether or not it is, you know, what would have happened. Uh, I also had a, a support system that uh, I didn't know was going to be here today, Brad Janowski, uh, who used to work for the IFI program in uh, the Lionel Lake Prison. It's a faith-based program. And, uh, he helped me put my faith back in, in God, and uh, that helped me through. And that's Were you able to pack your bags in your cell, or can you kind of describe what it was like the last few hours there? Well, I packed that up the night before. Uh, I had actually thought I was going to uh, uh, be going to court on, on uh, Tuesday, and uh, they came and hustled me out of there on uh, uh, Monday afternoon, and some transports coming, so uh, didn't have much time to think about it. You've been released from prison, but not completely exonerated. Your thoughts about that? It's disappointing. It's, uh, it's borderline tragic, you know, that there's, you know, I, I realize that there's mistakes that are made in the judicial system. It's disappointing that it's so excruciatingly hard to correct those mistakes. Do you, do you feel any um, any bitterness? You know, through all this whole experience, any any anger that you still hold? Can't do it. Can't do it. It's uh, I've been given a new lease on life by these people and the people that have supported me through the years. And uh, uh, going forward, it, it is impossible if you want to continue to live in the past. It's. Uh, it's not like it's just gone, you know. It, it's still there, uh, but I have a whole lot of people that'll help me through that, and, and uh, I have no plans on disappointing a single one of them. How helpful would it be for you to get some type of an apology from the BCA or the Wright County Sheriff's Office? Well, helpful. Uh, I don't need an apology from anyone to know what I know. You know, I was charged with a crime that I didn't commit. I was convicted of a crime that I didn't commit. And I know I didn't commit it. And so do a whole lot of other people. And if you're given the chance to read the things that I know, you'd be standing up here right next to me supporting me. So. Apologies. Not looking forward to any of them. Don't expect any. 
I know that uh, the field that I used to work in uh, might be a little tough to get back into, but I think uh, the legal field will uh, welcome me with open arms. And uh, there's plenty that I can do in that field to help others that have been through what I'm going through now. Any plans to sue for wrongful conviction? Thank you. As part of the agreement um, with Wright County uh, to release him, um, Mr. Olson has agreed um, to a complete release of the county and the county agencies and any employees or former employees of the county. Um, so, and um, Mr. Olson cannot, will not sue the county. Mr. Schultz, is there any compensation that uh, Mr. Olson will be getting for the years? There, as I'm sure a lot of you know, there is the compensation fund uh, for wrongful convictions, which was a, a legislative effort shepherded by Julie Jonas and others at the Innocence Project. Um, there are statutory criteria to be eligible for that, that technically um, it would be hard for Mr. Olson to meet. There may be some other avenues we'll explore, um, but um, we, we proceeded, I think, on the assumption that Mr. Olson is going to have to climb a lot of these hills himself with obviously a lot of resources and a lot of support. How long would it have taken, or do we even know how long it would have taken to try to get a complete exoneration? It's, it's impossible to put an exact time frame on it, but where we were in the federal habeas process, I think we would have been about three months out from at least from a hearing and then it's three to six months from that point uh, to a decision if not longer so at a minimum we were looking I think at probably at least a year and then if say we were successful in federal habeas and the state or Wright County appealed that then we're at two by the time this all played out, he might have served the entire 17 years. Any idea of what happened to Mr. Hamill that night? If I knew that, I wouldn't just stand here. I understand, uh, I heard on the radio a, a, an item where an investigator who had actually been one of the original investigators in the case said they didn't even consider a murder at the time, that it might be an accident. That was Chief Deputy James Powers. Uh, he was the one that took our statements back in 1979. James took our statements back in 1979, and uh, uh, in those statements, we also took polygraph tests, which we passed. I actually took two of them and passed them all. But um, out of all 70 of the people, I believe it was, that were interviewed back in 1979, those three statements from us three co-defendants, my two co-defendants and myself, turned up missing at the time of trial. At the time of trial. I think the other thing that's really important to know about Chief Deputy Powers as well, and one of the things that was very compelling to our organization, is he contacted us. Um, Deputy Powers, now retired, contacted us after Terry was convicted and said that he believed no crime had actually occurred, the death occurred because likely because a farmer was moving some sort of farm implement at night and accidentally hit Hamill and never knew he hit him. Um, and shared with us that he knew that these polygraphs had been done. Um, he had done them in 1979, that the guys had passed them, and he had no idea where they were now. It was very compelling to hear that from the law enforcement officer. You don't usually get that. Julie, was there a farmer then that said that he was moving farm no. equipment that night? No, no, no. That's just what Deputy Powers thought, because he had been one of the first officers on the scene, and there was no sign of a struggle. There was no sign of a beating to Hamill. There was no, no indicia, no, no skid marks from a car, no footprints in the dirt. So it just seemed as if, to him, Hamill had been hit once and knocked to the ground. Uh, and I talked to you on the phone, Julie, and I asked you this question. I said, when you first took on Mr. Olson's case, was were you were your eyes open like, oh my gosh, this is this man is innocent? What, what were your thoughts when you first took on him? Yeah, very early on, like I read about Terry's case in the paper before he actually wrote to us. 
and it, I read it, I think I, the article stuck with me because it talked about a cold case, so I thought it would be a DNA cold case, but there was no DNA in the article. And I read it again, and there was no DNA in the article, and I thought, how did they convict this guy, right? So I, I was interested in the case, and I knew that we would hear it. And we did, so my mind was already pretty open to the case, and like I said, very shortly thereafter, we heard from Deputy Powers, we started reviewing the documents, um, we knew about Ron Michael's case, where Dale Todd had, had admitted he had lied in 2003 and that nothing had happened, and it very quickly became a compelling case for us. What, what, what does this say about, about the, the jailhouse informants? Because it seems like this is what it relied on, right? The, the, the jailhouse informants were um, definitely involved in this case. There were a number of them, right? But on Terry's side, he also presented a number of witnesses from the jail who directly contradicted those jailhouse informants. And the jailhouse informants, they were all federal inmates. They were all getting a benefit for their testimony. The people who came forward from the jail on Terry's behalf, no benefit whatsoever except for they were telling the truth. Where is Mr. Todd now? I think he's in the Twin Cities. Um, he's also represented by counsel. When he came to us um, to admit to us that he lied, he was represented by counsel. And so we've had some meetings with him. We got an affidavit from him. I'm not sure where he is today. At, at what point did he make that admission to you? Back in August of 2013. Del Todd has, has probably made close to a half a dozen admissions through the years. Um, in fact, wrote a letter uh, to the my judge in my case, uh, stating that he had lied just days after I was convicted. So back in 2007, he wrote a letter. Correct. And then he, then, he, then he told the Innocence Project in 2013 to see how many. That's right. Yeah, he also told uh, investigators in my case and investigators in the Ron Michaels case the same thing that, you know, we were innocent, both and shouldn't be in jail. Uh, and where is Mr. Michaels? He's uh, in the Twin Cities area. Twin so. Cities somewhere, I have no contact with him. I didn't know Mr. Michaels before this, and I don't know him now. But the county attorney did um, notify the family so that if they had an objection to this, they could certainly voice it and be heard. Uh, and they also notified the Department of Corrections, who could similarly voice concerns. Uh, the family uh, did not in any way, shape, or form object to Terry's immediate release. Honestly, I was shocked that we didn't win in the Minnesota Court of Appeals. Uh, we were all, you we all there, were there, Terry. Yeah, but but um, yeah. those of us who were there, the Court of Appeals during oral arguments said, this is a compelling case, um, but then went on to find that under their interpretation of the law, it was procedurally barred. We disagreed with that. I disagree with it now. I, I have a tremendous amount of respect uh, for the judges of the Court of Appeals. I just think on that one, um, they got it wrong. What are you going to do when you leave here tonight, Terry? I'm going to take some quiet time away from everyone, you know, because you can imagine spending 11 years surrounded by people 24-7, and, and uh, quiet time is needed with the family. So, Terry, is there uh, anything that you're looking forward to doing uh, in a maybe recreational, like something that you used to do that you're... Yeah, I can't wait to go fishing and, and uh, jump back on a Harley. I can't, uh, you know, and the one thing that I, I waited for for 11 years uh, that I already did was walk barefoot in the grass. Terry, just uh, one question for me. Uh, I've lived in Minnesota for almost six years, and it changes all the time. Uh, just buildings are gone, things just different. It, was there anything when you got out of prison that you were just shocked about, uh, and can you second your mic and answer, uh, sure. that you were just surprised to see had changed in the city or in your neighborhood or anything along with it? Uh, everything. Uh, I comment to my sister and her husband how their, their backyard grew up. You know, trees that were this tall when I left are now 60 feet high, you know, so it, yeah, everything, it's, it's been a shock.
Julie, how many people has the Innocence Project helped to free who were wrongly convicted in your eyes? So Terry's number five in Minnesota. Um, nationally, we know that there's over 1,800 people who have been exonerated nationwide. How many more open cases do you have? Well, we get about 300 requests for assistance a year, and at any given time, I usually have about 40 or 50 open cases that are in some form of screening, investigation, or litigation. A Minnesota man is free after spending more than 10 years in prison for a crime he says he did not commit. 57-year-old Terry Olson was convicted in 2007 for the 1979 death. The mind has a strange ability to be able to shut itself off, especially when you're in total shock. And I just looked around at my surroundings and, and still couldn't believe what's going on. And it's like, this is my future? I'm looking at this going, this is my future, really? And I've done nothing? The, the thing that I've analogized it to, a, a lot of these wrongful conviction cases are they're like, they're like an airplane crash because it's usually it's not just one thing it's a series of events that build on each other and all go wrong to all of a sudden end up with the plane crashing or in uh, terry's case uh, finding himself being put on trial and then being convicted of murder why we ended up where we are today is something i can't answer you feel like you're standing on top of Mount Rushmore screaming for help and screaming that you're innocent, but there's nobody listening. And nobody did listen until the, the Innocence Project of Minnesota came along and, and until David Schultz from as an LLP came along. If they wouldn't have came along, if they didn't have the compassion to correct these injustices, I, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'd still be in prison.